It's Thursday, December 10, 2020. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ed Harrison, joined shortly by Tom Thornton, hedge fund telemetry founder and CEO. But first, with the news of the day, Haley Drasnan. Hey, Ed. Markets were mixed on Thursday after fresh data showed unemployment claims jumped sharply last week. 853,000 initial jobless claims were filed last week. That's the highest since September. It's a big jump from Thanksgiving week, and it likely overstates the underlying trend we saw following the holiday at a revised 716,000 initial jobless claims. To be honest, this was to be expected. The surge in initial claims is especially concerning when claims are still above levels near the peak of the Great Recession. If you look at the not seasonally adjusted number, it's even scarier, with 947,000 jobless claims filed. Continuing claims also increased to more than 5.7 million. It's the first time that number has gone up since August. Investors expected there could be declines in continuing claims as workers started rolling on to other programs like the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program after having exhausted their state benefits, but we're just not seeing that. That program is also expected to to expire at the end of the month. This ugly round of data is weighing on expectations for the December jobs report without a doubt. Thousands of people are losing their jobs every week because demand simply has not returned. When someone is let go today, I think that means the company doesn't see that job existing for a while, so we're losing momentum here. The rise in virus cases has put more pressure on the job market. It is suggestive of an increase in lockdowns and rollbacks for restaurants and other small businesses. Even some schools have closed again until after the holidays. Until the case counts go down, chances are these unemployment levels will remain high. This all raises concerns, of course, of a double-dip recession, as we've been discussing. Policymakers, though, are you paying attention? Fiscal stimulus is clearly looming larger here. Some believe the markets haven't done worse because there are still hopes that stimulus will provide the backstop. Also, the markets are trading at record highs and no one seems to be concerned. Valuations are above 1929 levels and moving closer to 1999-2000 bubble peaks. If you look at the Cape-Shiller P.E. ratio, which looks at stock prices divided by adjusted earnings over 10 years, it's around 33. That's nearly double the historical average, but still below the peak of nearly 50 during the dot-com boom. Stocks can trade at these levels for extended periods of time, especially since interest rates are so low and they'll likely remain near zero for a few more years. DoorDash and Airbnb this week are the perfect example of IPO valuations that were higher than expected. The market is following the path of expected vaccine success while the economy is following the path of the virus and the shutdowns. So to be continued. Back to you, Ed. Thanks very much, Haley. Tom, welcome back to the Daily Briefing. Hey, Ed, how are you? I am very good. And uh, I am excited to talk to you about DeMarc indicators. But first, we've got to talk about some of the crazy things that are going in the market with regard to uh, these IPOs recently. I know that you probably have some views on that. Yeah, it's crazy out there. It feels a lot like 1999. And what's really crazy is that you have buyers after the IPOs are opening up 100% or more. And, you know, I think the speculation is a little worrisome. Um, and this is what happens late in the cycle of a market cycle. And just a, a little crazy snippet on Airbnb, they had a, they have a hundred billion dollar valuation. Now, if you take Hyatt, Marriott, Hilton, Wyndham, Choice Hotels, Extended Stay, and you combine all those together, you're, you're at the Airbnb valuation, the market cap. Now, DoorDash is a $57 billion market cap. And this is really crazy. You take Chipotle, Domino's, Shake Shack, and Papa John's, and you combine those, and then you have DoorDash. And I'm, I think a couple of those uh, restaurants are expensive. But DoorDash is just ridiculous. But you can't short them. It's too volatile. It's too dangerous. You get squeezed higher. And sometimes, well, I, I like to say a lot, when it's obvious, 
it's obviously wrong. So you got to wait for the the you know the air to you know come out of them a little bit, and then they'll come back down to earth. But right now, there you you just I I don't want to invest in long or short uh, in those those companies. I think it's just wild. Yeah, I, I think it's great that you say long or short because you don't really know which way to go, and you know that it's not trading on fundamentals. That's clear that this is a greater fool kind of thing. I'm just going to make some quick profits, and so as a result, it's it's kind of hard to get get in front of that that train. Yeah, it's it is a train, and I'm I'll probably short these at some time in the future. I mean, we've seen a lot of IPOs come and go. And look at Twitter. Twitter went up a huge amount and then came back down, I think, by around 75%. And then it, it matured and, and came back. So I look, I just think that right now it's a speculative bubble happening in the market. There's areas to buy and there's areas to sell. Yeah. So, you know, um, let's move on actually to your sort of uh, broader views, because uh, I noticed uh, I'm, I'm just looking here on my screen that uh, you... Um, you put out a, a tweet yesterday that you're going to be on today, and mm -hmm. uh, you asked people what they should discuss. One of the first people to respond that had the biggest uh, responses uh, was uh, Rao Powell, who said he wanted to hear about DeMarks. He said DeMarc setups everywhere, nines, thirteens, a go, go, weeklies, right. three weeks out, two. Well, first of all, what's he talking about? And secondly, can you give us like the uh, the sort of the macro uh, DeMarc indicator elevator pitch, uh, okay. you know, view, because a, a lot of people don't know what that is. Right. OK, so I took some notes just so oh, I, I you, let me I, just interrupt you for a second, yeah. by the way, because I was just noticing that, you know, you do. This is a shameless plug, by the way, for you, Tommy, that you have a special for Real Vision, $250 off for uh, your yearly retail price. Uh, for uh, with 2020 as the coupon, I, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, no, that's fine. I'm, that's fine. I'm giving a shameless plug there as a result. No, that's great. So carry on now. Talk about what you you actually do. Okay. Um. So a lot of people, you know, they look at the mark indicators, and if you haven't used them, um, and you don't use them, they look like Greek, and you really don't have any clue how uh, to use them. I try to keep things really simple. And Tom DeMarc uh, created this indicator in the 70s uh, on paper, pre-computer, uh, in his garage. And once computers came around, he created another you know, 100 more uh, indicators. So basically, the DeMarc sequential, it has two components, the TD setup, and those are the green numbers, one through nine. And that that begins the sequential process. Now, that's that relies on the momentum of a, a move. So it mm -hmm. is a new turn up or down uh, with the green setup, and it finishes at uh, at nine. That's the completion number, and you you have to have with the setup nine consecutive days or bars. Uh, where the close each day is either lower or higher than the close four days or bars earlier. Now that's higher or lower, uh, depending on which way the the the, tr the momentum is going. Um, now, if that sequence is interrupted, uh, that green count goes away. It just disappears right. off the screen. You start again restart. from zero. Right. So. Uh, the second part is the countdown in the sequential, and that's the red numbers. Mm -hmm. And the setup nine has to complete for that countdown to start. And uh, that is a more of a trend-based uh, indicator uh, that looks really for low-risk opportunities to fade um, an estab established directional trend. So when you see these 13s, uh, the rule of thumb is that you have 12 bars or 12 days ahead, uh, you should see a price reaction the opposite direction. Now, if it doesn't occur, then that trend will continue, and that, that tells you something in itself. Now, the sequential is a little different than the setup, and that's the red numbers again. And it measures the depletion of buyers and sellers 
uh, in the market after the setup phase, after that nine, and then it determines the direction of the trend. So you have this trend going higher. It can go sideways, it can chop. It, the, the 13 uh, numbers don't have to hap happen in uh, sequence. They can skip, uh, but it has to qualify this way. Um, it's calculated, each number, each red number is calculated by comparing the close of the current bar to the higher low of the two bars earlier. So the setup, let me just re remind everybody about that. That's the green numbers. You have to have uh, nine consecutive days where the close each day is lower or higher than the close four days earlier. Now the countdown again, uh, it compares the close of the current bar to the high low of the two bars earlier. Once you get the 13, again, you should see a price um, uh, response. What Raul is saying is that we're seeing a lot of these 13s and 9s on a lot of different instruments out there uh, from stocks to crypto, uh, a, a lot of sectors, factors that I monitor. And that on when you see them on daily and weekly, it tells mm -hmm. you more that there is an inter intermediate trend that could turn. And again, we've seen this type of speculative action before. We saw this in 2017. Was it 2017 when when the we had the Bitcoin run up? You would know that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I believe that that's right. And I. I I'm not a Bitcoin bull or bear. I'm indifferent. And back in December of that of 2017, I put out to my people, I said, you know, look, I don't trade Bitcoin, but I have a DeMarc sequential uh, sell count down 13. And that was the day after the true high peak. Mm. And then at, at like 3,000, a little over 3,000 on the low, we did have a buy count down 13. And then, you know, it started moving higher and it's chopped higher and it's, we're now seeing daily and weekly uh, signals. Now the daily hasn't worked well, uh, but when that doesn't work, again, when those, those signals don't work, that's telling you the trend is very, very strong. So now we have the weekly, and I'm gonna defer to the weekly as something to really watch. Now I, I, I personally think Bitcoin can go higher, but I'd like to see a pullback, let's say, as low as 11,000, perhaps the 50 day, 14 to 15,000. Um, that might do it. And then That's we'll a see huge another pullback, one though, right? What's that? That's a huge pullback. Yeah, but that, you know, it's only pulling back, you know, X amount from how many weeks back or months back. And, that's what Bitcoin does. I mean, it does what it does. And it's not like it's going to move like the dollar, which I know you want to talk to me about. <laughs> you know, um, it, the first thing that comes to mind is, is when you said intermediate uh, trend, I thought to myself, uh, that sounds potentially, since the market's been going up, like there's the potential for a, a correction. Uh, when you talk about an intermediate trend reversal, what are you thinking about? You know, the, the last time we saw these these weekly signals uh, concurrent with the daily uh, was that 2017, and we extended even further into the, into January, and you had the speculative juices in the stock market. Uh, people were just throwing money and buying calls at that time as well, uh, not as much as they are now, but that to me says that we could cool off in the beginning of the year, maybe even sooner. I, I you know, December is a hard month to ever short anything. And I'm not recommending people go out and short the, the market here. But when this market starts to crack, I think there's a lot of air pockets below. Right. And that would be actually very healthy uh, for the market. The, people don't really want this market to go higher without having some correction. And I think that's um, important. You know, uh, I was looking at uh, something on your website in the hedge fund telemetry uh, site uh, um, where you were talking about uh, specific positions that you're taking. It looks like, uh, you know, if we go back to, say, October-ish time frame, we're looking at financials and energy in particular. Uh, you were taking some financial names off the table. 
Uh, you were still riding with some of the energy names. Can you talk to me about what you're seeing in those two sectors? Yeah, those are sectors that I really, really like um, with the reopening uh, that will eventually happen. Uh, let's say, let's start first with financials. Uh, financials have over-reserved in many people's opinions. Uh, I think that the, the um, I think the mandate was that they had to have reserves for 13% unemployment. And now here we are at what, 7% unemployment, just under 7%, it's probably higher. I mean, as they say that nobody can really calculate it uh, that great with what's happening. But once this reopening happens, all those reserves are gonna come right back. And uh, I think that'll be a tailwind for these stocks. And I think they're cheap. I will say, the last time I was on, I did take some profits. I was in J.P. Morgan, Goldman, um, a couple others, I, XLF, and today I, I sold all my the remaining financials. I sold Citi, I sold PNC, uh, KBE, which is my favorite uh, ETF for financials uh, for banks. Uh, I'm long energy still, and last time I was on, which I think was like a month ago, I said. I'm recommending people buy Occidental, and it, I'm up 50% in this thing, and now I'm up like 125%. It's getting a little frothy there. I'm not saying let's go out and buy Occidental today, but uh, you know, there's a lot of names that I I think still have. Well, they have Demarc counts of on the sequential from six to eight on 13. So we're going to go higher to get to those 13s, and Energy is a little ahead of itself because the seasonality for energy would, when it's best is towards the end of January to May. And, and that really has a very strong seasonal pattern. So I think we're a little ahead of that. If we get a pullback, I'm going to be buying more energy stocks. I think they're, they're cheap. I think that Biden, as much as he says, uh, and we're going to get rid of the you know, fossil fuels, we're going to limit drilling uh, new you know, areas for drilling. That's exactly what we want to hear because under Trump, there was, you know, you could drill anywhere. You could drill, you know, basically in the Hudson River, you know, if you had a permit, you could, Trump would have given you one, you know, no problem. So you had such, you know, you had such a, a glut in, in or uh, energy. And I, I think you will have a, you'll have less um, of this glut. I think the OPEC is trying to do what they do and, and formulate a plan um, not to drill more. They cheat, but so be it. But I think I think there's going to be less supply and demand will kick back in. And it doesn't have to kick back in that much, but people aren't flying. People aren't really driving anywhere. They're not traveling. And when that kicks back in, I, I think I think this is going to this is going to be great for the energy complex. It's going to be terrible for the economy because I I think somebody once told me like every point up in you know the, the dollar up in crude you know is like a tax on the consumer. So if crude goes back to sixty, I think it's more like fifty five on WTI. I think that's going to be a headwind uh, that people are going to have to realize uh, for the economy and for consumers. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, two thoughts on that. One is maybe uh, up to a certain degree, it's not in that the windfall for uh, the uh, the drillers and for the oil companies is positive enough to overcome, uh, given sort of the economic reopening. But you get to a certain point, say eighty dollars. Uh, a barrel where it's uh, where it is a headwind, and I'm looking at the numbers now, and it just seems like they're ripping. Today was a really good day. WTI it, earlier in the day it traded with the 47 handles at 46.84, mm -hmm. 85 as I'm looking now, and Brent's at 50 above 50, 50 to 30. So both up like three percent on the day. So uh, how much of that is priced in? What you're talking about in terms of the reopening, those levels that I was just talking about. How much higher can they go? Uh, by say the the middle of that time frame that you gave January to to May. Uh, I think we're going to correct, have one pullback, uh, perhaps in 
mid January, and then it'll be a little tricky and nobody will believe it, but it'll probably go up uh, towards February as the vaccines get out there and reopening starts to happen on the West Coast and people start traveling again, hopefully. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I I think you could be in the 60s. I don't see 80. That That's a little too aggressive. And uh, because there's, you know, the shale people will, will go crazy with whatever they can and, you know, pump as much as they possibly can. And, and uh, it'll, you know, work, balance itself out. Yeah, you know, uh, I've been doing some thinking about sort of human reaction with uh, this reopening that you're talking about. And, you know, there are a lot of people in surveys who say that uh, they won't take the vaccine. But, you know, I think about this. If someone were to ask me, are, are you going to take the vaccine? Well, the answer is probably more like, probably I'll take the vaccine. Let me take a look and see what actually happens. And so my view is, is, is that once the efficacy of the vaccine in real life, in, in real time, is apparent to people, everyone's going to jump on board and start getting the vaccine. And in no time, you know, by the end of the, by the time that you and I, if we're talking like this, um, you know, nine months from now, we'll be doing it in the studio. Yeah, that'll be, that's what we want. I'm, I'm not like uh, an anti-vaxxer. I'll take every single vaccine, you know, just to, I'll roll up my sleeve right now. I, I want to go out. I want to have fun. I want to go uh, and travel. I want to go to restaurants. I am sick and tired of wearing a mask and uh, I want my family to be healthy as well. Um, okay. So we'll see where, you know, what happens with some of these vaccines. I, I'm not getting it first. Um, I think that's going to the right people, uh, the first responders. And we'll see how how it, it it plays out. I mean, it's been rushed, obviously, and uh, but I'm I'm definitely uh, I'll be very excited to take a vaccine. I, I heard the the Pfizer one is really painful. It's freezing, and you know, you know, getting a shot that's cold um, is is horrible. And you know, but you know, no pain, no gain. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm with you there. I think I'm 100 percent on on where you are. By the time that they get around to me, we'll know what the efficacy is. I'm sure that I'll, I'll be lining up and uh, ready to to uh, to go out and do things I haven't been able to do in in, in a year's time. So, yeah. uh, Tom, what about other places uh, from a reopening perspective? Uh, I, I want to look at the commodities. Then maybe we can look at some sectors as well that you're uh, looking at. So, obviously, in terms of value, when people think. Uh, you know, value versus growth. Immediately, they go to energy, and then they go to um, they go to financials. And so we've already talked about that. Right. But when you go to commodities and you're talking about up cycles from a cyclical perspective, a lot of times you look at copper, and copper's ripped higher for quite some time now. What are you seeing there? I I think copper might stall out here. It's gone sideways. We have daily and weekly. Uh, DeMarc exhaustion signals. Uh, I also track market sentiment and it got to an extreme level. Uh, it could cool off a bit. And, you know, it's been it's been a great trade. And it's a that isn't, you know, the when copper tops, uh, a lot of technicians used to say, you know, it's a copper top uh, for everything in the market. And looking at, you know, the growth versus value you know, we've had a big move in a lot of these financials. Uh, we've had energy still going up. I mean, it's still it, the market's closed and they're still going up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Energy.com. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that you're going to see a little bit of a pullback. Like I, I one thing I want to mention, the Russell 3000 and the mm. Russell 2000, uh, the Russell 3000 basically has everything in the market that you care about. That has a daily and a weekly upside exhaustion signal right now. The Russell 2000 has a weekly happening next week, and it's. I, I'm really surprised how strong uh, that push was, especially with the pandemic or the the you know shutdowns and certain places are are happening again. Uh, but that's a little uh, over extended here and that'll pull back and and that's again my my theme that i i think we're going to see a pullback 
in the beginning of the year sometime, and then we'll see another move higher towards in, in the spring. And I mean, that's kind of what we want. We want to deflate the bubble a little bit and then, you know, move forward. Biden's going to have some stimulus measures, a big package that I'm sure he's going to push through very quick and the market will like that. But, you know, the rubber meets the road with earnings. And I think tech earnings, especially the, the names that have done exceptionally well, might level off. Right. And, you know, you may not see the same reactions that you've seen in the past with whether it's Apple or semiconductors. Semiconductors just had a, um, SMH just had a weekly upside exhaustion signal. And if you look at that chart, I mean, it's just parabolic straight up. I mean, that's like what copper used to do um, as an economic indicator. It's nuts. So I, I think, I'm short SMH, by the way, but I think that you're gonna see uh, some of these tech uh, areas cool off. I mean, they're priced in, you know, everything perfect. Right, and, yeah. And I, I don't really, you know, like, so Apple, let's talk Apple. I mean, great company. It's not cheap at, for Apple's, you know, for Apple. Uh, the best company probably, the great cash flow, everything's wonderful, but I'm not seeing the same crazy demand and people talking about the new iPhones. Um, I bought my wife an iPhone 5. It, hers broke. And it, there's no difference at all, except for the camera. And the camera is outstanding. So she's a very, she takes a lot of photography or for, for her work. And she, she's just blown away by the camera. But I don't need a camera. And a lot of people don't necessarily need a you know camera that's going to be that great. Mine's I have an iPhone 10. It works fine. So I think Apple's a little ahead of itself. They just came out with earphones that are like $500, $600. I mean, come on. I mean, people aren't rushing out to buy that. Maybe they are just for the ego trip of it all. But, but you know, the numbers earphones. speak for themselves. I mean, uh, when you look at the price earnings ratio of Apple and you look at the earnings growth of Apple, uh, there, there's a there's a wide gulf there. Uh, yeah. So I think that what you're speaking to, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, that Apple is a mature company. Uh, the the market cap tells you it's mature. Yeah, and it look, I I was on in the spring and I forgot who I was on with, but I I said you know you, you want to buy all of the best quality companies that you never thought you could buy at these types of levels. And Apple was my number one. And here, I think it it could just go sideways for a while. And I'm, I'm the cloud computing companies, I think, are kind of unappealing right now. Except I do like one, I did buy one tech stock today. I bought um, Salesforce, CRM. Interesting. And that, that's down 21% from its high. Uh, it was just added to the Dow, which doesn't really matter. But that has a downside uh, exhaustion signal, a sequential 13. The combo, which is sort of like the brother to the sequential, still has a few more days to go, but I'm a little early. And I told my people today, I said, you can either wait for the combo or just go along with me and have a wider stop. But I like the company. They, they do great work. It's not cheap, but I think down 21% in this type of environment, I'll take a go at it. Well, how much when you're uh, trading, are you looking purely at the demarc indicators, the uh, uh, buy signals, the exhaustion signals to make moves? And how much do you potentially let your macro view override uh, those signals? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I don't rely 100% on just the demarc signals. I ha I also use some of Phil Erlanger's work, which is just outrageously good. He's the ex, um, he was a longtime Fidelity technician. He has his own company. Uh, I work very closely with them uh, for short interest data and some of their momentum indicators that I've been fortunate to be able to use um, a lot more. Uh, I, I do have, you know, I took level one CFA, you know, that's back when it was yearly. And my wife and I were having a baby, we were trying to have a baby. 
And uh, I got drafted to go to a hedge fund. This is back in like late 90s. And I just said, I, I, can't, I can't go back. I was just consumed uh, working for the hedge fund. So as I, I learned enough to know how to look at valuation, how to look at a balance sheet, uh, there are a lot better people that can dig through that stuff uh, than, than I can. But I get a good grasp of what I need to know. So I, I blend some of the fundamental stuff I know with the technical stuff. Uh, I also like to look at, you know, what businesses they're in, uh, what their, you know, the the addressable market uh, out there is for them. And that's that's sort of the process that I use when I'm looking at a particular uh, company. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I want to make a sort of a hard shift away from that, the micro that we were talking about to pure macro, because the last time you and I personally spoke, we talked about uh, DXY. We also, I think, talked about Euro, uh, EUR, USD. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the signals that I was seeing were suggesting that, uh, you know, they were low for the dollar and high for the euro. And, and that's definitely the case now and actually it's probably even higher for the euro and lower for the dollar and i believe at that time you said at some point it looks like that that trend could reverse where, where are you on that today well i think i i'm just looking at the bloomberg dollar index and the dxy and it's gone sideways for the last five days and actually i think it i think it closed with like a four-day high a closing high it hasn't turned yet, and I did have a recent daily uh, exhaustion signal with the combo, and that, that hasn't turned yet, and I think it can. Sentiment did not get that low, and the stuff I look at, uh, it's ranked from zero to 100 as far as you know, bearish to bullish. Uh, it's at 30% right now, and I like to see it when it gets under 20%. I've seen it even lower. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. So it's not lining up perfectly for me. Uh, but again, if the market starts to tail off a little bit, I think people are going to rush to the, the to the dollar. And you know, the I think the consensus is that the dollar is going lower. And it probably will, but I think we could have on the DXY a uh, move from where, you know, the 90-ish level to 95. And then, right, and we'll see where we go from there. Yeah, and you know, uh, it was interesting when you said uh, people will rush to the dollar if the market uh, falls. That shows the degree to which, as I was going back when we were talking about micro, where maybe your fundamental, your macro view uh, influences uh, how you're looking at the position. So you're thinking, yes, uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I have to be cognizant of the fact that if uh, all of these DeMarc indicators that are showing uh, exhaustion in the equity markets uh, come a cropper, then it will have uh, knock-on implications for currency markets. Yeah, I 100% I, uh, I agree. Now, I'm also I just got I, I just got long gold and and silver, and I was short uh, for a while, uh, and it made a high in the summer. Uh, we did have exhaustion signals on the upside uh, at the exact highs for gold and silver, and we just sort of trickled down lower lows, uh, lower highs, and it got to a level that uh, gold sentiment was under 20% briefly, and it's moved a little higher. So I got long gold and silver. I think there's a lot of tough resistance, but seasonality for gold really is prominent, it, it comes out um, pronounced in December through January. And some people used to say, you know, it's because the, the India, the people buy tons of gold during the holidays. I don't know. But it seems like it, it tends to work and it got low enough. So I'm giving it a go. It's not a high conviction trade. And if the dollar sinks even more, um, you know, there's implications there. But if the dollar goes up, you know, there's my trade could be, you know, completely wiped out. Uh, but they could also go up together. I've seen that happen in the past as well. It's not as highly correlated as uh, it used to be. 
Yeah, very uh, uh, you know, good framework about a lot of different things. Anything that we missed, uh, Tommy, today that you want to talk about? Huh, let's see. Uh, I'm just looking over on my screens. Uh, I still like the energy stocks. Um, I think tech's going to top out uh, for a while. And I'm trying to find, I'm, I'm desperately trying to be balanced and find ideas to buy. And I think that's what uh, people need to do in this environment. Uh, there's tons of speculation. There's tons of call buying. We talked a little about that, but there's going to be a big roll off uh, come next Friday uh, with option expiration. A ton of calls are going to roll off and we'll see what else happens. I mean, we have also that, I mean, somebody said, don't talk about Tesla, but we have the Tesla rebalance uh, ad next week and which will go towards the end of the week. And then it's the print on Monday, which Monday morning on the open, which is sort of weird. On Monday, the 21st of December, the Mayans have on their calendar, uh -huh. just mark this down, the end of the world. Um, <laughs> now, I've called a lot of tops in my day. I've been right on some and wrong on others. Uh, the Mayans have had a really terrible <laughs> record at calling the end of the world. So don't worry about that. Um, there's some planets lining up as well, which is, I, you know, it could, I don't know. So hopefully we don't have that happening. Uh, if the mines call the top, I hope everybody was long going into it because, you know, <laughs> you know, we'll, if well, we, we'll uh, back uh, on Monday, uh, we're okay. Uh, you and I, we won't be around to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, people to gloat about our being wrong that uh, the Mayans uh, got it wrong because yeah. well, well, it was the end of the world. Yeah, you know, if there's nuclear war going on, um, my my hard and fast rule is to buy every single thing you can because you can't cover if you're dead. Okay, nobody cares, but if you're alive, you know, maybe you have some asset that that will work. But you know, that's that's the the rule for the end of the world type trade. So that's just me being funny. Excellent. Well, Tom, as always, it was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hope to talk to you again soon in maybe two or three weeks. Yeah, hopefully if the mines. Um... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, Ed. You bet.